Okay, so part two of the the, the models and sagas, uh, as Peter rightly called it. Um, part one last week, I described my father's war experience, how he set up in business and the expansion of the company in the highlands of Scotland. I ended the talk making reference to the discovery of oil in the North Sea. The oil industry was to totally change the fortunes of the Morrison business. In 1974, Consolidated African Selection Trust, or CAST as they were called, agreed terms with my father to purchase 80% of the business. This was motivated by CAST's search to invest in the UK, a beneficial tax regime, and most importantly, they were looking for a quarry business to support their planned investment in the North, in, in North Sea concrete rig construction. This was a good time for someone to purchase a company as there was strong evidence of a good flow of business. And at that time, Morrison were involved in seven major contracts in the Tain area alone. Effectively, Alec had lost control of the company that he had set up 25 years previously. Cast also purchased an adjacent quarry business, which they merged into Mollison and left Alec and his family to run that business. Cast did have a director on our board and they worked with us to professionalize our reporting structure. This was to prove a huge benefit going forward. I was working for Tarmac building a new access road in Edinburgh at the time. And I recall the phone call I received from my father who strongly recommended that I came back north to work for, for the company. Alec Morrison had no degree, no formal business management training, but had learned sufficient from his parents, his prisoner of war experience, and from his 26 years running the business to fit extremely well into this very new environment. Alec was just 55 and had no plans to retire. At the time of the sale to CAST, Alec was employing 425 people. And at the same time, the oil industry had arrived on his doorstep. As you can imagine, the high wages offered by the oil industry was a constant lure for his employees. But Alec had developed incredible loyalty and was able to keep the business intact. By 1976, CAST had been acquired by Selection Trust, and Selection Trust had acquired a major English civil engineering business called Lehane, Mackenzie and Shand. Morrison became a subsidiary of Shand. In 1977, Morrison acquired Alexander Sutherland Goldsby, in, that's up in the in north of Tain in Sutherland, which, he had, which added a civil engineering capability to the, to the company. Since 1948, when Alex started his business, the scale of the contracts that the business could undertake had grown beyond imagination. The business had moved in, into quarrying and, and added civil engineering to its portfolio. The company also had become a subsidiary of a major London-based mining finance house. Most importantly, despite all this, the business remained a family concern. What became blatantly obvious was that expansion could no longer be restricted to the Highlands. In 1980, the head office moved from Tain to Inverness and the offices were, open, were opened in Aberdeen, Perth, Edinburgh and Glasgow. Morrison had evolved into a major Scottish contractor undertaking civil engineering and building works wherever opportunity allowed. In the Scottish Highlands, the business benefited hugely from the oil industry, where we acquired a steel fabrication business and the quarries benefited from huge orders of sand and aggregates sent by ship to Sullen Bow in the Shetlands. Up until this point, the Morrison business had interfaced almost entirely with local authorities and government clients. What the oil industry did for us was to allow us to learn how to interface with the private sector. This was to benefit the business hugely. Morrison were expanding at a staggering rate in many different directions. 
Now, going back to the acquisition of Alexander Sutherland Goldsby, this gave us civil engineering expertise. And in doing so, we inherited amazing employees who were young and ambitious, just like Fraser and I. Sutherland's had not long finished the Kyle of Tongue Crossing and had successfully secured a contract to build a section of the A9 across much of the Black Isle, just north of Inverness. Civil engineering leaves permanent landmarks behind and the profile of Morrison started to grow. Contracts were secured for the A94 between Perth and Aberdeen, a bypass around Elgin and many, many more. In 1981, Selection Trust were acquired by British Petroleum, BP. Within a year, sold their interest in Shand and therefore Morrison to a company called Chartered Consolidated. Experiencing periods of considerable change was something we were very accustomed to and learning to take maximum benefit. Having the support of Shand and Chartered Consolidated gave us the financial muscle to qualify for much larger and complex contracts. In 1982, Morrison secured the contract to build Kelskir Bridge. This was an entirely new challenge. At the time, the contract was tendered at 2.75 million and there was nothing simple about any part of it. The deck, as you can see, was carved and the legs were inclined. The client was Highland Regional Council and the design engineer, Ovaro. The contract started to have major cost overruns due to the complexity of the design, making the construction extremely difficult. On this type of contract, the contractor takes the responsibility to keep the structure stable during construction. And this was challenging. Our team was led by Les Corbett from Tain, and his team were in, in their 20s and early 30s. At that stage, you never give up. You just look for solutions. These solutions were found and the bridge was completed on time and to the highest quality. One particular innovation that enabled an early delivery was the precasting of the center section on land and then lifted into position. And here you see a picture of my father filming the lift in the background. The Queen opened the bridge on the 8th of August, 1984. And on the morning of that day, the Highland Regional Council agreed to honor their contractual position and paid us 4.75 million. The contract was to lift the reputation of Morrison across the UK and was an excellent advert for the business. The bridge received many accolades for its design and construction, but probably the greatest accolade was in January 2019, just last year, when it was designated a Category A structure. In other words, the, the bridge became a listed structure. As Kyle Skew was under construction, the business continued to secure contracts across Scotland and the development of innovative expertise did not slow down. Contracts were secured for a hotel in Glasgow, a co-op in Inverness, factory in Linwood, new academy at Culloden Inverness, a new community centre in Barra and many more. At the same time, Morrison created a new development business where we identified sites, found clients, or tenants, built out the projects and finally sold on the project to investors. A major co-op in Inverness was one of our earlier projects. Now using the same expertise, offices and supermarkets were built in Aberdeen, Glasgow and elsewhere. The sale of the 80% of the business by Alec Morrison in 1974 had proven to be a very timely and correct move. With the larger balance sheet behind us, we were able to expand beyond all recognition and, added, and with the added capability of civil engineering, engineering and property development. Without any doubt, the quality of our people, along with a strong corporate and quality brand, ensured this expansion was conducted in a very controlled fashion. The company was able to maintain its own characteristics and personality, which usually is only achieved in a family business. Everything we did was undertaken in a very professional manner, whether it was our interface with old and new customers or the publication of annual accounts. By 1986, 
we were fast becoming one of Scotland's leading construction concerns and we needed a strong presence in Edinburgh. We believed in the strong promotion of our brand. New customers and the securing of larger contracts was essential if we were to maintain the momentum behind our growth. Soon after we opened our Edinburgh headquarters, we sponsored a high profile exhibi art exhibition at the National Portrait Gallery. This proved very successful and many high profile guests and, few, few, and future clients were able to join us. For many of the employees invited to co-host to co the event, along with the wives and partners, this was a very different experience. And we ensured that we were all caref carefully trained and had the confidence to meet and have conversation with our guests. I, I recall we were very insistent that our hosts did not spend the evening chatting with our mates. One project that demonstrated how believing in ourselves and persuading others to believe in us was the securing of Edinburgh's most prestigious development at Exchange Plaza on Lothian Road. Phase one was 96,000 square feet across seven floors, comprising of offices and a restaurant and eventually sold on to the Clydesdale Bank. This project also received the accolade of a featuring, featuring on a £20 note. Morrison's ambitions were not restricted to these shores. As we searched for work internationally, we sought work in Colombia, Russia, Ghana, Azerbaijan and Kuwait. It was in Kuwait where we achieved our greatest success. After the end of the first Gulf War, we were the only UK company to secure work for the American Corps of Engineers. We were awarded contracts that were exactly 16.6% of the total spend, as this was the percentage of effort that the UK put into the war. The support we received from the Foreign Office was absolutely incredible. This project put Morrison very much on the map in UK terms. Another interesting and high profile project was the acquisition of Chester City Football Club. We acquired the club, moved the club to a new site with up to date facilities and redeveloped the original site as a retail park. The club was then sold back to its fans for one pound. And I think you would agree this is innovation at its best. Previously, I talked at length about the achievements at Kyle Skew. In 1988, we secured another major bridge contract close to Tain, the crossing of the Dornick Firth. This was a spectacular achievement of innovation and delivery. The contract was tendered on a design and construct basis, giving Morrison the opportunity to develop the most cost-effective solution and design. What we developed was an indoor factory arrangement where the deck was constructed under cover and then extruded like a tube of toothpaste and pushed out over the columns that had previously been put in place by a highly specialist marine contractor. In March 91, the Lord of Tenants of Ross and Cromarty and Sutherland witnessed the final push of the 15,000 tonne structure traveling six meters. And then the handshake that celebrated that the Dornick Firth had been crossed. The Queen Mother opened the bridge on the 27th of March, 1991. And this project was delivered some three months early. With Morrison having his roots very firmly in Tain, it was only appropriate that we celebrated the Kelsky and Dornick successes with our own Morrison branded whiskey. With a business now spread across the UK and internationally, we required something that linked us all together. What evolved was a culture, a culture that focused on our people and very much put our clients first. This started very firmly in the company's, started very early in the company's history. You've already seen my father's involvement in the local carnival in Tain and the presentation of the sundial. Here, my father shared the profile with his employees. In 1973, the company was 25 years old and my father's early employees had worked for him for around 25 years. In recognition, in recognition, my father started what he called the 25 Club. 
And this was the first such gathering with my father in the very white shirt at the front. When my father retired, the 25 Club presented him with this painting of Achel de Bui on the west coast of Scotland, and that's where my mother's mother was brought up. When the company reached the magic age of 50, we created the silver, silver salver containing the signatures of all those in the 25 Club by then. As you can see, the list was extensive. Maintaining and upscaling the culture of the business became increasingly important as we expanded. How could we get the message out to the several thousand people that then worked for us? We had read with interest how total quality management had improved efficiencies in Japan and the USA. So we created our own form under the title Total Quality Morrison. This was not just a marketing fad. We totally believed in it across the business. And we celebrated, in celebration, we developed a series of cartoons. And so I'll share some of these with you. We celebrated success when goals were achieved, whether it be engineering excellence, finishing projects ahead of client expectation, high safety achievements, or when employees develop innovative solutions. We created this model of the most famous cartoon and awarded these to employees. The construction industry is highly competitive and you only succeed if your price and your service is excellent value. Lower than the opposition and when the project is secured, you're able to deliver at the set price or below. The cartoons that we developed um, delivered this message in a manner that all employees could relate to. The construction industry works in some very difficult environments and normally outside, but that is not an excuse for waste. We calculated that our company was wasting the value of a house every day. Loyalty and involvement are key ingredients for success. We listened to what our employees told us and received in return tremendous loyalty. Quality and efficiency improvements are not one-off events, and we recognise that they were continuous improvements. And the most important requirement is teamwork, which many companies, organisations, and I would say many in politics now, seem to forget. We set ourselves annual improvement goals and shared the results across the business and beyond. The Morrison story highlights many other project successes, which all played a major part in what was an incredible journey. It was, of course, not possible to mention every story and everyone that contributed. In, the late, in late 1988, 1988, our parent company, Charter Consolidated, invited the Morrison team to review the activities of their construction interests in England. What we found was not a scene of excellence but we were confident in our ability to sort it out. This obviously spread our management expertise across a much wider business and geographical area. These companies were called Shand and Biggs Wall, and their combined turnover was significantly higher than that of Morrison. I was 37, had always lived in Tain. I traveled down to Bedfordshire to take responsibility for the Biggs Wall business. This was quite a cultural challenge for me. And to add to the complexity, Biggs Wall's primary activity was in the gas and water utility sector, an area which I had no previous involvement. My father, my father had taught me well to listen before taking actions and to be very decisive when giving direction. Prior to me arriving, Charter Consolidated had tried to take their own actions to resolve the trading difficulties and decided to change the name of Biggs Wall to Shand Southern. Name changes do not change the fortunes of a company. The business was headquartered in Alsey in Bedfordshire and now north of London, an office where Charter Consolidated Management were also based. The culture of Biggs Wall and, the Charter, Consolidated and Charter Consolidated were at the opposite end of the spectrum to Morrison. So my first challenge was to change that. My first few weeks was to gather information and to meet the senior management. 
the first document I was handed was a consultant's report that recommended very strongly that the utility business should be closed down. The employees I met were high quality and determined to find a better route. So I binned that report without reading it and set about rebuilding a very battered business. My next action was to announce at the Christmas dance a few weeks after I had arrived that the name of the business was to change back to Biggs Wall. And this, as you can imagine, was received with much celebration. Positivity is always an important point. So I changed the Biggs Wall corporate colours from this lavatorio yellow to the Morrison corporate colours and started to invest in new equipment. I then had to tell our potential clients in England that I had arrived and was hungry for new business. I followed what had been a success in Scotland and put on some high profile events across the country in venues such as Madame Tussauds, Hampton Court, Harewood House in Leeds, Wimple Hall and Gold Hall in London. In the latter, we held a burn supper, which was a great success. We also moved to a small head office in Stevenage, which again demonstrated our determination to succeed. Within 12 months of being invited to review these businesses, we were invited to acquire them along with the Mollison business. This, this, of course, we took full advantage of. The 20% of Mollison that my father retained proved invaluable. Following the buyback of Morrison and acquisition of Shand and Biggs Wall, we set about integrating the business under a common brand. Biggs Wall became Morrison Biggs Wall and Shand Morrison Shand, and both under the same corporate colours. Through demonstrating strong leadership, corporate integration and changes in brand can be managed very successfully. We continued our quality agenda delivering innovations and, and, and innovation and rising profitability. We'd also become a very diverse business, both in our activities and geography. We took full advantage of the government's private finance initiative, securing some of the early projects. The expansion and involvement in capital intensive activities resulted in us, in us deciding to float the company on the London Stock Exchange which was successfully achieved in 1995. My father passed away at the very young age of 79 in 1998, but I am delighted that he saw the business float on the London Stock Exchange, and he also was able to join in some of the 50-year celebrations. PFI, or the Private Finance Initiative, was to become a major focus for Morrison securing contracts such as upgrade of the A69, water treatment plants and the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary as shown in this slide. In the 90s, government and major clients were increasingly receptive to innovative approaches from their service supplier, suppliers and Morrison were very proactive in responding to this challenge. Four important projects were secured on this basis. In Norwich, we sold our ability developed through, through our utility business and secured all the maintenance activities of Norwich City Council. This contract required us to take over all the maintenance employees of Norwich City. But for a period prior to all the employees transferring to Morrison, they marched the streets in protest. But immediately on our arrival, they were totally cooperative and savings of around 25% were achieved very quickly. For Thames Water, we secured an amazing contract valued at 100 million to install water meters using a similar approach. And in this contract, a new meter was being installed every 10 seconds. For Anglian Water, we secured a contract where their and our management were merged and the cost savings shared. A similar but very much larger contract was secured from Thames Water in central London. And this was our first contract in London and it was just as difficult as you can imagine. Yet again, we delivered savings in the order of 25% for the client. All these contracts came under the general heading of partnering, an approach we had learned from the oil industry in the Scottish Highlands. 
The construction industry is full of risk, with the most important being the safety of the employees. Health and safety was a priority right across the models and business, and discussed at the beginning of every project or business meeting. Our safety, our safety record was one of the best in the industry, and that helped us to secure more business. In the year 2000, the Morrison business was acquired by Anglian Water, and this changed everything. And within 12 months, my brother and I exited the business. This should have been a perfect fit. Anglian Water had the balance sheet and Morrison had the commercial expertise to both expand and introduce major efficiencies across the Anglian Water business. Unfortunately, it did not turn out that way. The Anglian management felt threatened and since they were the acquirer, their senior management decided they would run the Morrison business. It all for a short time went wrong and the Morrison people had to fight very hard to retain the culture and brand profile that proved successful over the years. Fortunately, Anglian Water realized reasonably quickly that they did not have the expertise and they sold the Morrison businesses, but in two different transactions. The part of the business that was to benefit the most from being sold by, by Anglian Water was the Morrison utility business. This was the business which in 1988, management consultants recommended should be closed down. Contracts in the utility sector came larger and larger and with clients outsourcing more of their work. As I left the business in 2001, we had just secured our first one billion pound contract with the British Gas. This was over a 10 year period and set the business up for rapid expansion. The part of the, well, could, could I just point, make a point at this point that one of the, the managing director of Morrison Utilities, Charles Morrison is actually on this call tonight. The part of the public, the public sea of a utility contract is usually a hole in the road surrounded by barriers. This business is considerably more complex than that. One of the key components is the management of data. The Morrison utility business has now evolved into M Group Services, of which Morrison Utility is the larger part. This business has a turnover of around £1.2 billion per annum, which will be an accumulation of tens of thousands of jobs, each requiring an instruction to commence a road closure, utility cut off the utility, barriers, excavation equipment, the removal of, an ex of excavated material, the importation of new material, the arrival of the necessary materials to do the installation and labour to undertake the work. In the end, of course, the client also requires to receive a bill. In total, there are millions of individual data elements. And I always saw this business as a data management business or logistics management business. At the end of a utility contract, there should be nothing to see and the public should be disrupted for the minimum amount of time. Major civil engineering projects are very different. Falkirk, uh, Morrison have built and worked on some amazing iconic projects. The Falkirk wheel being one of these. There are a few projects which are more photogenic. The wheel revolves lifting and lowering leisure craft between the fourth and Clyde canals. Due to the perfectly balanced structure, they tell me the energy required to turn it is equivalent to boiling a kettle. And this is another project that featured on Scottish currency, this time on the, on the Bank of Scotland 50 pound note. It also recently, very recently, appeared on a stamp. Internationally, Morrison continued to search for new opportunities. They were involved in the removal of asbestos from the abandoned whaling ships at Gridviken in South Georgia, along with the building of a reservoir. This followed work they undertook in the Falklands on the construction and positioning of Haley 6 for the British Antarctic Research Station. In order to spread risk, it is not uncommon for construction companies to work together on major projects. This was the case on the Queensferry crossing. Morrison had less than a 20% stake in the project, but provided the majority of the senior construction team. The project director was Michael Martin, who's on this call tonight, 
who was persuaded to come out of retirement but had previously been on the main board of Morrison. The Morrison had built much of its reputation in the Scottish Highlands with the Causeway and Tongue, Kyle Crossing and the Dornick Bridge. The Queen's Head Crossing was of another scale. 19 million hours of labour, 35,000 tonnes of steel and 208,000 tonnes of concrete. This was one of the largest and most complex civil engineering projects anywhere in the world at that time. The construction partners were Degadis of Spain, Hotif of Germany, American Steel, and of course Morrison from Scotland. Although I'd left Morrison many years previously, I did visit the site on a number of occasions. The moment I recall most was when one of the, the team on the Queen's Ferry Crossing um, as I was looking out over the top of a 207 meter high column, said how amazing it was that a company established in Tain in 1948 was such, having such a major role in such an iconic and, a, and advanced engineering project. My father, Alec Morrison, would have been so proud to have been standing where I was that day. And this was one of the moments that inspired me to commission the Morrison story. Companies change, Fortunes differ, but have been part of a journey laid down my by my father in 1948 has been an amazing privilege. As I say in the foreword to the book, I passionately respect all the people who worked for Morrison over the last 70 years. Only with their skills and determination would the writing of this book have been possible. <laughs>